This time on Poll Hub, the aftermath of the 2021 elections. A disaster for Democrats? A post-Trump roadmap for Republicans? Something in between? None of the above? Oh, and how did the polls do? Sounds like that's enough for a full show. But wait, there's more. Our national poll with NPR and the PBS NewsHour on what Americans think about our elections. We asked these questions before Tuesday. There are some pretty stunning results, and we're going to look into those. Finally, save room at the end for the age-old question. Dogs or cats? That's Lee's fun fact. Pick a side. Busy day. Let's get to it. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm Jay DeVapper. And I'm Barbara Carvello. And I'm Lee Merengoff. We had uh, an election on Tuesday. Um, nothing really happened. So let's move on to the next topic. Just <laughs> uh, lots to talk about. Obviously, two uh, races that every uh, cycle after the presidential year capture uh, at least the political world's attention, Virginia and New Jersey governor's races. Uh, and they were uh, maybe a little more newsworthy than they have been in the last few years. And to talk about this, uh, we are welcoming Jessica Taylor. She's the Senate and governor's editor for the Cook Political Report with our friend Amy Walter. Actually, the title is not with our friend Amy Walter, but she is our friend. Uh, and Jessica is too. Jessica, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So, um, Virginia, let's start there. Um, uh, surprise, not a surprise. I'll just note that the polls in the end were actually pretty accurate. They, the, most, the, most of the end polls had, had the Republican winning, any one. Yeah, I mean, we saw this race continue to tighten over the last few months. We moved it to toss up at the end of September, and that was when really the internal polls that I was talking with both Republicans and Democrats about, it was within the margin of error. It was very clear to me that something was happening here, really. And I think we started to see that being reflected a little bit more in the public polls in the final sort of few weeks of the race. You did see Youngkin start to pull ahead there. Most of the polls, um, I think there was one outlier with Fox that had it Youngkin up eight, which both sides that I talked to didn't think that was correct at all that it was going to be within the margin of error. You know, I sort of privately said it was probably going to be two points either way. And that's about what it ended up being uh, about that, <laughs> about two and a half points, it looks like when, you know, we're obviously still waiting for final absentee ballots and different things, but they were pretty on the money. And I will just say, you know, I think what it did measure was, you know, being on the ground here in Virginia, where I live too, you could just feel that there was the momentum behind Youngkin's campaign and having, you know, followed these races for a while and Terry McAuliffe's campaign, he's trying to come back as governor. Um, of course, there's this history in Virginia, as you mentioned, with the uh, race that happens the year after the White House, you know, going back to 77, um, typically the party that has just lost the White House ends up winning. The year that didn't happen was in 2013 when Terry McAuliffe broke that streak. So he's trying to do it again here. Um, Virginia has become more democratic since 2013. And so I think, you know, the math was there for him, but the momentum was clearly, you could see just, you know, when Amy wrote a really good column about this a couple of weeks ago, the side that's angrier is the one that usually turns out. And you could just feel that. Um, and McAuliffe was really sort of, it, to me, it felt like he was sort of grasping at straws in the final days of the race, you know, trying everything to paint Glenn Youngkin as, Trump light, you know, he called him Trump in khakis. Um, I think that that strategy could, it worked in the California recall that we saw earlier this year because, you know, the top replacement candidate, um, conservative radio host Larry Elder, he was very Trumpian. He sounded like Trump. Glenn Youngkin did not sound like Trump. He came across as a suburban dad, sounded, you know, very reasonable and not scary and not like he's going to go on Twitter rampages and stuff. And, um, it's it worked. And, um, you know, we saw that I, I do think the polling was was very accurate in this race. And I think it captures some of the the late momentum there and what happened. So, so so our takeaway from this, how much of it is was Donald Trump a factor? How much of it was Joe Biden a factor? How much of it was the McAuliffe campaign, the Yunkin campaign? historical forces that you alluded to. I mean, how do how can I divide up? Uh, Lee, that that sounds like a that sounds like a book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not just an interview, but good luck. Good luck with that, Jessica. <laughs> it was almost a perfect storm, I think. There was a culmination of factors. You had the history, you had Biden's numbers dropping in a state that he lost by 10 points. He won. Uh, or he yeah. won by 10 points. Excuse me. He won it by 10 points. 
Um, in the polling, we the polling pretty much showed his approval rating had dropped to somewhere in the low to mid 40s. Um, exit polling showed it was somewhere around 45, but still not where you want to be in a state that you just won by 10 points a year ago. Um, I, one thing that I think we thought on election day, you could see that there was heavy turnout including in very democratic areas. And that was one thing that I talked to Democrats about. They said, you know, if we have big turnout, like we feel good about this. Um, that necessarily wasn't the case everywhere because yeah, Democrats did turn out, but Republicans turned out in even greater force when you look at very rural areas and in suburban areas, especially, you know, I was looking, there were two counties that were key for me when I was looking at the election results, Loudoun County, which is in the Washington DC suburbs and exurbs. And that's been sort of the crucial hotbed of these education issues. Um, you've seen protests at school boards. There was, um, you know, a sexual assault case that became a really sort of devi divisive issue there um, that, that the student had assaulted another student was allowed to go to another school and really a big controversy over that. Um, critical race theory was certainly something that was talked about, certainly, but I think that it, when Democrats tried to just dismiss this as something of a race issue would miss, I think, bigger education issues because it wasn't just critical race theory. I think you had parents that um, worried about their kids falling behind after being in virtual school for a year and transitioning back to classrooms and um, worries about that. There was talk about other schools here in Northern Virginia, you know, doing away with accelerated or gifted classes and different admission standards for some of the best high school public high schools here in the country. So it was a lot of things that were going on. And I think COVID played into that um, a lot just because you had parents that were very worried about their children's education. And so I think maybe the, mo the most critical moment of the race happened in the final debate between McAuliffe and Youngkin when McAuliffe was asked about a bill that he vetoed as governor that would have let parents um, know if their children were reading sexually suggestive or explicit material. Of course, the book in question was Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is a Pulitzer Prize winner. But I mean, it was a bipartisan bill that passed in, this, in the legislature. Um, you know, but the way he worded that, he gave Republicans a huge gift saying, I don't think parents should be telling schools what to teach. So how much, how much what is Virginia um, just idiosyncratic because you have a, a former governor uh, running uh, for a non-consecutive but another term, um, and you know, sp you know, specific faux pas and that. Or is it really a bellwether, uh, or should be a wake-up call for Democrats looking down the road to 2022? I think it should be a wake-up call. I think it showed that they still have a lot of problems with rural voters. Um, that these suburban voters that they were able to woo to their side during the Trump years are not necessarily going to stay with them. You have to give them a reason to stick with you. And I think that would have been Biden delivering on a lot of these things that he's talked about, including you know infrastructure and the Build Back Better bill. And I think the stagnation in Congress didn't help. And it also showed that I think voters want a forward looking um, plan and not to talk backwards about Trump. Almost every word out of, McCall's mouth the last few weeks was Trump trying to hope that would work, but it didn't. And um, I think that's something, you know, in 2018, when Republicans took, or when Democrats won back the House, House candidates, you didn't see them talking a lot about Trump. They were talking about what they were going to do and protecting health care and different things. And I think that's another reason why you could kind of feel that McAuliffe was losing steam and was sort of grasping at straws there because it was they wanted to turn this into a referendum on Trump, and it really did not feel like that was the case. So I think Democrats and ones that I've talked to in the aftermath of the past, you know, 24, 48 hours, they recognize they have a message problem, and it's one that they need to solve before going into 2022. And let's be clear, this isn't just Virginia. We've only talked about Virginia, and we only have a couple minutes left. But in New Jersey, that was a shock. The polls didn't quite capture that. There weren't many polls, but um, uh, the governor there, the incumbent governor, barely eked out a win uh, by 20, 30,000 votes at the end of the day. It's going to be about that much in a state that is decidedly blue, although it does elect Republican governors. 
Um, but it, yeah, and then in Long Island, in our area, for instance, there's the, all the all the races people were watching countywide where there were Democrats, all the Democrats lost pretty much uh, at, at the level. So this isn't just a Virginia thing. I do wonder, though, um, you know, before we we go is. It, it, we, we tend, and as a political reporter for 25 years, I know that I was part of this, we tend to focus on the moment and forget that the next moment is a year away and everything can change over that period. Is So when you when Barb talks about it as potentially being, is Virginia idiosyncratic, I wonder if this election is idiosyncratic or if it's 2009 and in 2010, the uh, you know the chickens come home to roost. I'm not sure. I think that uh, the next year will tell us. But you're right. I mean, look back to what the past 18 months have been, and none of us would have imagined this was in store at the beginning of 2020. It depends on what happens with the pandemic, how things continue to recover. But I mean, look at what we have now that we didn't have a year ago. We have rising inflation. We have higher gas prices. We have higher prices at the grocery. That all played into Virginia, too. And clearly, there was something going on there in New Jersey, too, that polling missed. And you know, I will just say there in New Jersey, there's a little bit of history there, too, because no Democratic governor had been reelected. 1977. Right. So Murphy did do that. And right. of course, Chris Christie was governor before Murphy. So Republicans have been elected. But, you know, I do wish there had been more polls in this case, because I think Virginia has sort of overshadowed everything. And this was one that got lost a little bit. Well, I think we're certainly going to have to talk in the future with Jessica about the Senate uh, and, and other governor races, because the Senate and the House are going to be so hotly contested going forward from here. Well, let's get through the holidays into 2022, and then we'll have you back on in the beginning of the year when we, <laughs> when the dust has settled a little bit. And we, we were talking about all the hot races in 2022, because that is going to consume a lot of time, I'm sure. Anyway, Jessica, uh, Jessica Taylor, again, the Senate and Governor's Editor for the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, now it's time to get a little bit of sleep, right, after uh, this crazy last few months for you. It's not as bad as 2020 when I just felt like I took weeks to catch up. So, you know, at least this was two elections. Just, two, well, for me, it was two elections, you know. Yeah, and, and, and I understand her dog is back on the correct sleep cycle now, so. Yeah, he, he slept through the night last night. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. These last couple of governor's races, we actually didn't do polling. We didn't do any statewide polling on the on these governor's elections this time through uh, with our partners. But we did do a poll with our national partners, um, NPR and the PBS NewsHour, on how people uh, look at elections and whether in fact they are trusting uh, the results. I think one of the observations, uh, at least when I was watching the, the returns uh, uh, this past week, um, was that it seemed like uh, the media was pretty cautious um, in reporting uh, the results. Um, they were uh, um, talking about each of the races first is, uh, I'm talking specifically about the governor's races where there was exit polling in uh, New Jersey and Virginia as uh, too early to call and then too close to call, which is that exactly what happened. But for me, it just seemed a, a bit more staid. I, I don't know whether it was just the, uh, the fact that there weren't a whole host of, of um, elections uh, that we were looking at. Um, but in our poll, 62% of Americans say they do trust the results and will trust the results of uh, the upcoming uh, presidential election in 2024, even if their uh, candidate, which they support or vote for, loses. But there was something really interesting under the top line, and that's 82% of Democrats said that they would feel trusting in, in election results, but only a third uh, of Republicans. And we asked a number of questions on, on, um, on elections, on voter suppression, on voter fraud. And throughout the data, we see this very similar pattern. Um, Democrats uh, very much in, in um, support uh, of the election process and trusting in it. Um, independence kind of in the middle, the majority, um, and in some cases, two thirds of independence, uh, but Republicans uh, being much more suspicious of the process. Uh, not surprising given the uh, debates and discussions that we've seen, but uh, what are the implications uh, here uh, for uh, 
not only 2024, but certainly 2022, which is going to come around where the whole Congress uh, is up, many senators and governors as well. well. One of the things Donald Trump has brought to our political universe is that when you lose, you don't necessarily concede. In fact, you call it a, a rigged election um, and, and you suggest that there was fraud involved, regardless of the fact that there has been no evidence from the last presidential election to that to that uh, occurring. But certainly that's that's not new. I mean, in fact, Republicans are very concerned that there is fraud. I mean, when we see a lot of these debates yes. about voting in the states, um, Republicans want to uh, make sure there isn't fraud. Democrats want to make sure there isn't voter suppression. Yeah. And so so the question is, both sides in this, and there are two, <laughs> two tribes at work here, and both sides uh, think that the democracy is under threat. And as you correctly identify, the cause of the threat is seen as very different. One is being more on the Democratic side saying, Democrats are saying there's voter suppression, and we're certainly seeing a lot of activity in the Congress and, and around states moving in that direction. Uh, to, to try to alleviate something which may not, in fact, be a problem. Um, and uh, Republicans are, are, are yelling, uh, uh, you know, are thinking that uh, they're being accused of, uh, are saying there's fraud and, uh, and that the, uh, there's a, a need to uh, kind of like clean up our act in terms of how elections are conducted. Regardless of that, I think we do run the risk, and, and, and certainly our poll showed this, that when Candidates are defeated and do not concede, and obviously the illusion there, the references to 2020, uh, that that causes some harm in the process. We want candidates to step up and say, I've been beaten. Uh, and I'll just throw one more monkey wrench into this. In 2016, Donald Trump also claimed that there was fraud and that he had not only won the electoral vote, but that he had won the popular vote and millions of votes hadn't been counted. Uh, it's the first time I think that a winning candidate has claimed that there was uh, irregularities and fraud. Usually you, you only do that when you lose. Yeah, well, I was going to ask, there's a lot to chew on here. And um, what did you find most surprising, Jay? So when you ask if the, what are the implications are for 2022 and 2024, I think the bigger question is what are the implications for democracy mm -hmm. when only one third of the voters in one of our two major parties says in 2024, if their guy or woman doesn't win, they're not going to trust the election. I think that is deeply disturbing uh, to to what a democracy depends on, which is the peaceful transfer of power. And that is what's at risk here. I don't think it's a political risk. I think it's a fundamental existential risk to the democracy. And I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. I, I do think that. I think that's where we're at. And I think a lot of people are talking about that. I think some very serious and sober people are talking about it in ways that have not been talked about in a century in this country. I do think it, what this poll shows is something deeply, deeply troubling. The other thing is, last night, two nights ago, on Tuesday night, in states controlled by Democrats, Virginia, controlled by Democrats, the entire voting process, if it's controlled by a party, is controlled by Democrats. A Republican won, and not a single Democrat went on TV and said, fake news, false, voter fraud, this is wrong. And not a single Republican went on and said anything about that in places where Democrats won, which did happen in a few places. The yesterday, or not yesterday, on Tuesday night, that narrative vanished. But it vanished, I think, because at least in the case of the, the Hallmark race in Virginia, the Republican won. I, I just, I think that it's uh, remarkable how, uh, and we've talked about this, the silos we live in, the bubbles we live in. There's a great article in the Post about the uh, news diet of of voters of certain of, of one side or another and the news diets are absolutely entirely separate and so we're not really talking about the same things we're not living the same reality and that's where it you get these numbers where one third of voters in the, one of the big in the, in one of the two major parties only one third says yep we'll trust the elections if our guy loses i mean that that's crazy to me that's just crazy well, the one consensus that we do all seem to have is what you pointed out, Lee, which is that everybody thinks that there is a threat to democracy. Uh, we just see it as uh, very different threats and we're kind of pointing across the aisles to, to one another. Um, I, I think what really struck me in this poll was we, we asked a question about 
um, whether um, Donald Trump uh, in his con in, in the fact that he continues to falsely say that the 2020 election was rigged. Um, we asked people um, whether they thought that he was uh, speaking with this narrative because he didn't like the outcome or because um, he actually has a legitimate claim and there are real cases of fraud that, that change the results. And although 62% of Americans believe uh, that Donald Trump is doing that because uh, he doesn't like the outcome, fully 75% of Republicans believe he has a legitimate claim that there real, were real cases of fraud that changed the results. Um, so when you're talking about this existential threat to the, the democracy, um, it's, it's very real. And um, is, is, is it up to the leadership um, and these candidates to, to um, be able to concede or accept, you know, accept defeat or accept winning graciously, um, you know, as uh, many of us do in, in other situations and we often see on the, on the ball field. Uh, where, where are the solutions for this? I think the media has to step up uh, because there are things as facts. And our, our, our dear old friend, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan talked about how people's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own case of the facts. And there are facts and there's been evidence brought to bear and there have been court cases and almost without fail, the court cases uh, have suggested that there was no fraud. And even to the point where the, the uh, attack on the Capitol in January, on January 6th, uh, which had to do with this whole, you know, transfer of peaceful transfer of power, uh, people were, you know, right now are being told, you know, uh, to, you know, don't believe your own eyes, believe what I'm saying. And, uh, you know, we saw the tape, we know what happened, and yet it's being spun as to something very different. And so I think that is part of the underlying erosion of our democracy that, that Jay's alluding to in, in what kind of, uh, you know, just the, the, the noise that's out there and how detrimental that is. Well, there's a lot of information in this poll, which we've just uh, touched the surface of. So uh, if you want to drill down on this, because there are a lot of interesting tidbits, uh, you can see this uh, on our on our website and also uh, uh, Domenico Montanaro of NPR uh, and Laura Santhanum of um, the PBS NewsHour have also written uh, interesting pieces, pulling out some of the uh, the, the the interesting um, c conclusions and results in this poll. We'll put links to their work uh, in the show notes so you can catch that. Well, it, it usually provide me a, 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 There we go. Thank you. I was looking for the uh, segue, Jay. And I <laughs> segue. There's your segue. Actually, Barb's actual real dogs might have provided those because occasionally they yeah, just I'm speak surprised. up. But... I'm very surprised. Yeah, they, they missed their, their cues. <laughs> All right, so we so we do turn to the segment called Lee's Fun Fact, and uh, we do look at the uh, 19, um, 1948 poll uh, that our research team has dug up, uh, and uh, also the 2021 more recent numbers, uh, also with the assistance of, of the Roper Archives at Cornell, uh, who keeps all this stuff and much, so much more available to people. Uh, but basically, the question is uh, is a question of uh, dogs versus cats in terms of pet ownership and or or any other uh, cat, uh, animals for that matter. And um, although in both cases uh, we, we see and then Jay, you kind of gave it away because uh, you were barking in the background. Yes, there's far more dog ownership uh, than cat ownership uh, in the nation. Uh, f um, the recent poll shows, uh, and you can have multiples obviously of this, but just 70 percent uh, having a pet um, have a, a, own a dog, and it's 40, uh, 46 percent a cat, and then very little of anything else. Yeah, you could you could have more than one pet. So it, this in this instance, it doesn't need to add up to a hundred. Also, these are people. These are of people who have pets, which was fifty eight percent. So fifty eight percent of Americans in this twenty twenty one poll have pets. Of that fifty eight percent, seven in ten of those have dogs. Dogs rule. Yes. Yes, I mean, well, isn't that the Barb's, story? Barb's household, there's a lot of equine uh, out there also. Yeah, horse is not they, listed on this list, Barb. No. You are an outlier. 
Well, the thing is, um, they're very often, and much to my dismay, referred to as livestock rather than pets. Oh. Um, although certainly the uh, the horses uh, that uh, live in, in the barn here uh, are, will definitely qualify as pets. <laughs> well, I should point out, though, that the 1948 survey, which showed very comparable findings, uh, which was done by the National Opinion Research Center, uh, NORC, um, was of physicians, we believe, and high school teachers. Uh, but if you look down in the very, very fine print, you'll see that this was, you know, kind of like this bar of orge. Yeah, uh, this, no, was a, this was an animal experimentation survey, uh, which I think had to do with, uh, you know, ultimately looking at, you know, how you feel about animals being used for scientific experiments, uh, which you may have different views on, uh, but, uh, in the process of that, they asked people about their pet ownership and dogs, again, uh, reigned supreme as, as the more popular item. Well, you know, what I thought was really interesting about the, um, the, the, the 1948 research was, one, you mentioned horses, uh, Jay, and uh, 3% uh, actually uh, answered when asked about pets that said that they had work animals, uh, a horse, a pony, or a donkey. And another 2% also said um, that they have um, major food animals, such as cows, goats, sheep, lambs, and pigs, um, something that didn't come up in 2021. Yeah, well, that's the difference, again, between 1948 and 2021. There's a lot of differences, but there's one that I think maybe there's no partisan difference on that. Maybe we can all be. We should point <laughs> out uh, that two, two of the three of us currently uh, are dog owners, uh, Jay and Barb being the two. Yes, but you would qualify under the had a dog. Yes, I was a had a, a, had a dog. And certainly as a, you know, a god yeah. of a dog. <laughs> there you go. yeah. But I had cats growing up, but I've since seen the light. That should get our <laughs> mail and phone lit up. <laughs> uh, yeah, that'll get the social media going. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we, I, I guess the ending to this is that we want our candidates in the future to not go barking up the wrong tree. How's that for a uh, a, a, a reach? Jay, you're going to give me a slam dunk on that. Nope. No, I think we should go. <laughs> And, and before we really exit, uh, Casey Schaff, uh, our wonderful assistant, would like to comment in her own way about dogs versus cats. Casey? On behalf of cat owners everywhere to this conversation. That'll do it for Poll Hub this week. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mary Griffith is our executive producer. Casey Schaff is our production supervisor. The Poll Hub team includes Ashley Marcinic and Marcello Bettman. If you enjoy Poll Hub, please consider leaving a review. Positive reviews help other like-minded listeners find us. If you'd like to learn more about polling and survey science, check out the Marist Poll Academy, our free online learning portal. If you have questions, tweet them to us at Marist Poll. Finally, however, wherever you listen to Poll Hub, there's a subscribe button. Click it and the latest episode will be ready for you in your podcasting app as soon as it's released. We'll see you next time.